is a comfort to my soul. Your word is the truth that sets me free. Well, hi there, and welcome once again to Bible Talks Bible Study. Yes. Continuing in search of Christianity and continuing in our study of the letter to J letter of James, and this is our third part. Third, third. Yes, I think so. Yeah, I think so too. So we'll be we're still in chapter one of James, and we'll be we'll be starting off in verse twenty-two. So make sure you have something. Have your Bibles. Have some note paper or something to jot down. If something strikes you, if you have a question or a comment, jot it down. If you verse strikes you, jot it down. Participate is the word I'm looking for. All right. Father, we just thank you, Lord God, that you give us this time to be together. And together can be across, across time and distance, Lord God. We thank you for this way that we have to communicate. Because, Lord, the Word of God needs to be communicated. So I pray, Lord God, that you would put a guard over my mouth, Lord, and you would ensure that whatever I speak is what you've put in my heart. And I thank you for all of the folks who are part of the Bible Talk ministry for their prayers. Let's go. Okay. Right, so hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. All right. As I said, we're going to start in James chapter 1, verse 22. But prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Paul said it's not the hearers of the law who are justified before God, but the doers of the law will be justified, Romans 2.13. Otherwise, you're deluding yourself. You're lying to yourself. And worse yet, you're lying to yourself and believing the lie that you're telling yourself, right? We need to be a people of action. That's one of the things that's really important here. And I, and when we started this study, I talked about Martin Luther and his approach to the letter of James. And what concerned him was how much it focused on works. But it's not works. It's faith and action. That's right. Okay, and uh, faith without action is not faith at all. Yeah. It's dead being by itself. So Jesus said, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father who is in heaven will enter. Matthew 7, 21. It's about doing the will of God. Okay? Yes. What you hear here, please let the Holy Spirit speak to you. And what he should quicken things to your heart. It should become part of your heart. And then you have to act upon those things. You have to do them. You have to... Don't just hear the word, do the word, all right? Because the, actually that's what it is when you're hearing it. That's God speaking to you, and he's asking you to do something. Um, ask me is a very polite word. <laughs> yes. I, I don't believe that there are many requests made by God in the Scripture. They're commands. That's right. And Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. So I think we have to get to that place where we understand that you know, Jesus said, from whom much has been given, much is required. God has given us his word. Yes. He's given us his word written on the tablets of our heart. He has given us his word walking in the flesh, Jesus Christ. We're responsible for what he's given us. We need to use it properly and wisely. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you who he's like. He's like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who has heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation. And the torrent burst against it and immediately it collapsed. And the ruin of that house was great. Luke 6, 46 to 49. You need to take the word that you hear. If God is speaking to you, no matter how he's speaking to you, and remember, he can speak to you through anything he chooses to, you need to act upon that, because that's when it starts to become real in your life. You know, Paul wrote in the Romans, he said, faith comes from hearing, hearing by the word. 
But when the heart man believes, right? right. But then when the mouth he confesses. Right. But then then you have to do it. And you have to do it. You have to you have to believe it, you have to hear it and, and believe it, you have to act upon it. Hear, say, and do. Hear, say, and do. I, I want to say this, all right? Uh, you just pray about this. Hearing God leads to faith. Yes. That should lead to obedience, yes. to works. Mm -hmm. And that will lead to the blessing, blessing others and blessing you, blessing God. Mm -hmm. Okay? It does require a, a, a obedience. You know, way back when in Deuteronomy, Deuteronomy 28, it talks about if you hear his word and do it, act upon it, then you're going to be blessed. If you hear, if you hear his word and don't act upon it, you're going to be cursed, right? It's not. I want. To, I'm trying to trying to see how to put this here. Because it's not that God is. You know, you're not earning it. And I, I've used this example before. Suppose somebody called you right now on the telephone and said, "Hey, you know what? There's a man down at Burger King, and he's handing out hundred dollar bills left and right. All you have to do is get down here, and I'll hand you hundred dollar bills." You say, oh, praise God, that's wonderful. I mean, boy, I could use that. So you hop in your car, you turn on the engine, you steer that car right down to McDonald's. You say, well, I like McDonald's better than Burger King. You're not going to get the $100 bills. Are you being punished? No, you just chose not to do what you were told to do. And you miss out on the blessing. God has given us all his word. It's all a blessing if you do it. If you don't do it, you're just going to miss the blessing. And it really is that simple. And, it, and it's love that will motivate you to do what well, you hear from God. It's because you know he loves you and you trust him and you trust yes. his word. Because if you don't do that, if you don't act on the word, then you fall into the category of those who James just said here, delude themselves. You're fooling yourselves. You're, you're believing a lie. And yes, Satan is the father of lies. Yes. But you can be the worst liar in your own life. All right, let me read on. Verse, I'm going to read verses 23 and 24. Same, same thought here. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he's like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. If you forget the kind of person that you were, your natural self, you will forget what God has done for you already. And God has done much for you already. What has he done for you? Everything. Everything. Jesus Christ on the cross is simply everything. God gave you everything. He gave you, He gave his beloved son, Jesus Christ, for your salvation. Amen. If you can't... He's given us eternal life. But that's what turned Paul on. And he says that in Romans 8. If, if God would give his only begotten son, his beloved son, to die in my place, what good thing would he withhold from me? We have to get to that place where we, where we hear his word, we believe his word, and we act on his word. Because we know we can trust God. And we know that he knows better than we do what we should be doing. All right? I'm going to move right on to verse 25. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides in it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man will be blessed in what he does. The perfect law, the law of liberty, the law of love, as James calls it here in a few verses on, because he said, you know, if however you're fulfilling the royal law according to the scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you're doing well, James 2 8. If you're, if you're following that royal law of love, that perfect law, you're going to walk in the fullness of God's blessing. Yes. That doesn't mean that the world will love you. That doesn't mean that the world no. will bless you. No. But it means that you'll walk in God's blessing. And that's what matters. And that's who we're trying to please and be approved by. Because otherwise, you will have become a forgetful hearer and rather than an, an effectual doer. If you don't put into practice, obey what you hear from God, you will forget it. Yeah. You will. And I'm not talking about, oh, I can't remember exactly how that verse I'm talking about knowing in your heart what God has spoken to you, what God has promised to you, what God has done for you. You'll be able to walk in the power of God. 
So that's why it says in Deuteronomy, way back in Deuteronomy, it says, Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments and his ordinances and his statutes, which I am commanding you today. Deuteronomy 8.11. You see, you'll forget if you don't keep the commandments. If you don't keep them, you'll forget them. Yes. If that's not enough motivation to become a doer of the word, I don't know what, what it is, all right? Because it said, you know, James goes on to say, this man will be blessed in what he does. God's great desire is to bless you. Now, I'm not talking about what so many prosperities of preachers are preaching. I'm talking about that the blessings of God are. Well, you know what? They really are the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Yes. To know that you're walking in the love of God, to know that you're walking and have that joy of the Holy Spirit, to have that peace that passes understanding. If you don't think peace that passes understanding in this day and age is important, maybe maybe you have been asleep for the last 20 years or so. God's desire to bless you is about that relationship with him. And now it shall be if you diligently obey the Lord your God, be careful to do all his commandments, which I command you today, the Lord your God will set you high above all the nations of the earth. All these blessings will come upon you and overtake you if you obey the Lord your God. That's what it says in Deuteronomy 28, verses 1 and 2. That's what I was talking about. The blessings of God, if you obey, if you hear him and obey them, the blessings of God will come upon you and they'll overtake you. Now think, of, think about that. The blessings of God will overtake you. We see him in the church today if you so concerned about going out and seeking God's blessing. I need to find God's blessings. The promise of God is here. If you just hear and obey him, the blessings will find you. Amen. They'll come find you. They'll flat run you over. I mean, they will come right after you, all right? Isn't that, isn't that a really nice promise to know that God's blessings will come and find you? That you don't have to be going and searching them? What are you supposed to search for? You need to be seeking that deeper relationship with God. Period. So verse 26 and 27, I'm going to read now, right? If anyone thinks himself to be religious, and yet does not bridle his tongue, but deceives his own heart, this man's religion is worthless. He goes on and says, pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. You think that you're religious? You better pray about that, right? But now he says, you better you better bridle your tongue. You better control your tongue. Now, I'm, I'm not going to go into that too deeply now because James goes into that much deeper, a little, a little bit later on. And it's such an important, important topic to control your tongue. Okay, but I don't want to... And it goes into, follows what we, we talked about with being slow to speak. Which is what we talked about last week. Being quick to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Quick to listen. Quick to listen. All right, to be religious. You know, let me just ask you a question. What, what is religion? When I say the word religion, what do you think of? I, I, I took time to look at a number of dictionaries. And I looked at the word religion and I looked at the word religious. Interestingly, I did not find one that said to visit widows and orphans and, and widows and keep yourself unstained from the world. Not one dictionary did I find that defined religion as that. And yet that's exactly how God defines pure and undefiled and religion. religion. Mm -hmm. So it appears to me there's a disconnect between God's thoughts and God's ways and man's thoughts and man's ways. Have really? Heard, really? <laughs> Have you ever heard that before? So I mean this is really, really important. That we come to the understanding because typically what we're thinking of um, it, it gets down to what well, it gets down to rituals and relics yeah uh, I love the book about that right religion or religious comes from the Greek word threskaya and that talks about a ceremonial or outward relationship with God and that's not what God is searching for yeah. God searches the heart he looks inside. He's not going to let your outside things. It's not about what things you do and outward appearance. You go to church on Sunday, you die. He's searching your heart. 
That's where he's looking for pure and undefiled religion, right? And that's why he said, you, you honor me with your lips, but your heart, heart is far from me. And it's also... Those are, those are religious people. They are religious people. That's why David, a man of God's own heart, a thousand years before the birth of Christ, was praying, create me a clean heart. Cleanse my heart, Cleanse my heart oh God. Religion is not about what you do ceremoniously and outwardly, but it's about, because rituals and relics, that's the way of the world. It's about what's in your heart, your relationship with God. Religion, true religion, undefiled religion, pure religion, is about redemption, righteousness, and relationship. Those are the things that God has done in our lives. He has redeemed us. And think about the cost and what that took, right? To bring us to a place of righteousness. Not, not being good and being nice, but being right with him, right? Because it's all about relationship. Please understand this. A lot, I mean, just think about this. Christianity, well, Jesus Christ did not come to earth to start a new religion. He did not come to start a new religion. He came to restore an old relationship. A relationship that man first had in the garden when he walked with God. When mankind was there walking and living in the presence of God. And that was lost because of sin. So he sent Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, his beloved son, into the world to heal that and restore a right relationship. And that's the only way that you can enjoy or partake in that relationship is by accepting the work of Jesus Christ on the cross, right? Amen. The old Latin word, you know, I, uh, I went to a Catholic high school and somewhere in Latin is the chosen language, not the, not the Greek, right? And the word for religion comes from the word religare, which means to bind fast, right? To lock something in. It binds rather than sets free. And that's surely not the law of liberty. Jesus Christ came to set the captives free. He came to set us free. Right? Think about it, it, where this all ends up. With, in Revelation chapter 17, where it talks about mystery Babylon, the mystery of Babylon, the mother of harlots. You see, in Babylon, they built a tower. You, you know about the Tower of Babel? And they built that to reach into heaven. Right? So their goal then would be that the only access to heaven would be through their building. Yes. Now yes. let me promise you that that seems to be the case in a lot of Christianity today. Mm -hmm. That if you want to reach out to God, if you want to get to God, you got to go through their building. It's not about buildings. God doesn't live in a house built by the hands of man, right? He's building a, his perfect and pure temple out of living stones, which is us. Okay. Bring them in the building to get salvation. Yes. So it's not about that. It's about your relationship with God. And that relationship is not dependent on a building. It's, it's dependent on you receiving that free gift of God. Sharing. Proclaiming. Proclaiming. Proclaiming the good news. Yeah. Let me get, I want to read another verse here from Colossians 2. I'm going to read verses 20 and 20 through 23. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, why, as if you were living in the world, do you submit yourself to decrees such as do not handle, do not taste, do not touch, which all refer to things destined to perish with use, in accordance with the commandments and teachings of men? These are matters which have to be sure the appearance of wisdom in self-made religion and self-abasement and severe treatment of the body but are of no value against fleshly indulgence. Uh, this, this is, we have to be careful. How much of, of religion, how much of what we call Christianity is self-made, made by men, not by God? That's a reasonable question, and it's one that deserves your considered thought. You know, it's not about being religious. Paul stood in the midst of Athens, remember? And he was at the at the, the Aragapis and said, men of Athens, I observe that you are very religious in all respects. You can be religious and be paid. I mean, yes. 
being religious is not about a relationship with our God, okay? You know, talking about that, we've had lots of times people say to us, we're, you're so pleased that you're religious. And we would say to them, no, we're not religious. We're, we're righteous. Righteous. I love we it. Have, and it's all about relationship, not religion. It's all about relationship. Uh, well, that's because the church, quote unquote, has convinced people that it's about these worldly things that demonstrates you know, your relationship with God. It does not. It absolutely does not. Your, your relationship with God, your relationship with Jesus Christ is demonstrated through the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Absolutely. Through that's his love. Is. And it's his love that's been poured into your heart through the Holy Spirit. Romans 5, 5. It's his joy. It's his peace. When people see that, it's your, it's your dealing with people with that love, with that joy, with that peace, with that patience that demonstrates the love of God. That's where they will see the love of God. And yes, you are most assuredly obligated to show forth the, the love of God. For we have been called out of darkness into his marvelous light to proclaim his goodness, to proclaim his glory. Talking about the relics, you just put me in mind. Um, I had an aunt, Catholic, of course, and there was a time when there was a, a blackout, and it, the people in the in the, I met her in the in the um, in a store, and people were just kind of hustling and rustling around, and she had always worn this pouch of medals around her neck and stuff, you know, in her blouse, and she was clutching that and. And in such fear, that was incredible. She had such fear, and that's what that's what they're lacking is the is the peace, the fruit of the Holy Spirit. She had absolutely no fruit because I've been convinced that. The, and, but she was clutch, clutching onto the relics to get her, the relics to get her peace, and, mm -hmm. and there wasn't it. Mm -hmm. It was absolute total fear. Mm -hmm. Get rid of the relics out of your heart. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Um, No statue going to save you. No. There's no statue going to answer you. The Lord said, Because his people draw near me with their words and honor me with their lip service, but they remove their hearts far from me, and their reverence for me consists of a tradition learned by road. That's Isaiah 29 13. I mean, this is not, this has been going on for a long time. So it's not about those traditions. Uh, false religion is man's attempt to have a relationship with God. To have a relationship with God on your own. Or just to appear to have that relationship. I mean, this is what people deal with, right? True religion in the eyes of God seems to be man's relationship with mankind. Widows and orphans. That's religion. That's right. It's not about your relationship with God. It's about your, religion, your relationship with each other. Spirituality now that's about your relationship with God. Mm -hmm. Obviously, religion can be worthless or worse, right? Mm -hmm. That's another example of people deceived in their hearts about the relationship with the Lord should be, right? Think of what Paul said to the Galatians. This is a church, right? He said, oh, you foolish Galatians, mm -hmm. who has bewitched you? Christ will be of no benefit to you. Galatians 3.1, and... and and five too, right? Because people were putting their trust in rituals, right. in relics, in things, rather than putting their trust in God. Now remember, the first revelation of the devil in the Bible is that he was more subtle than any other beast of the field. He can be very, very subtle. That's why Paul wrote in, in, to the church in Corinth and said, you got to be on guard, because he said, I'm concerned lest the serpent who deceived thee come along and remove the simplicity and purity of devotion to Christ. Satan is always trying to get in there and complicate things because our relationship with God is not complicated. It's just a, it's a love affair. He loves you, and because of that, because he first loved you, you can you love him, right? So if God demands, and that's the right word, demands, mm -hmm. that our relationship be pure and undefiled, what then is impure? And defile religion in the sight of God. I mean, I, you know, one it's either one or the other, right? Yeah. He says your religion, 
Pure religion has to be pure and undefiled. If it's not pure and undefiled, then it is impure and defiled. What defiles your religion? What removes the purity of your religion? Uh, you lose sight of the fact that it's all about the gift of God, right? So let's let's go for a minute and just start in chapter two. Chapter two starts this way in verse one. My brethren, do not hold your faith in our glorious Lord Jesus Christ. The King James says respect of persons, an attitude of personal favoritism. God doesn't have, I mean, you know, he's no respecter of persons. It's that clear. Peter said that. Peter opened his mouth and said, of a truth, I perceive that God is no respecter of persons. Acts 10.34. So, I mean, how, are we respectful of persons? I mean, do we look at the outward appearance or do we see what God has done? Go on a field trip. Go into a bad neighborhood in the town. Pick out the, uh, and I say this prayerfully, pick out the bummiest person you can find in town and look intently at him and imagine that person worse than you yet. Somebody as bad as you can see. Now concentrate, appreciate, meditate on the fact that Jesus willingly suffered those horrible stripes, suffered that cross, allowed a crown of thorns to be placed on his head, and it was that person's sin that the King of Glory took upon himself on the cross. I mean, have you, are you considering these things? These are the truths of the Spirit of God, right? God the Father poured out his love, and Jesus poured out his blood for that person. In Christ Jesus, there is neither male nor female, there is neither Jew nor Gentile. There is those who do his will and are the family of God, and there are those who have refused it. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't accepted it, so far you have refused it. But his love is available to all. all to all. All. And you have to choose. If you want to try and understand this, just try and understand this. Praise God. Give thanks that you do not get what you deserve. Thank you, Lord. I mean, we really should be thankful for that. People have said to me, I you know I have this little habit I have developed over the years. We're traveling and somebody will say to me, God bless you. And I say, he does. More than I deserve. That's the truth. He does bless me. And it is absolutely true that he blesses me more than I deserve. He doesn't give me what I deserve. He gives me that. He took what I deserve and placed it on Jesus Christ. For the wages of sin is death. That's the grace of God. That's the amazing grace of God for which we should be giving thanks all the time and growing in our understanding and knowledge and thankfulness for that. I talked about that mummy person, talked about each other. I said, that, you know, what we're talking about here, that pure and undefiled religion, it's about love between men, you know, men and women. It's pure. It's undefiled. How does it become unpure? How does it become defiled? Well, don't let yourself get stained by the world. That's, that's it. Stained right? by the world. That's... All right. So bearing in mind that we are to give honor to whom honor is due, think of what Peter said when he was sent to the house of Cornelius. And when he entered the house of Cornelius, this is in the book of Acts, Cornelius honored him. Yes. Cornelius wanted to honor Peter was a mighty man of God. Cornelius. So it says, when Peter entered, Cornelius met him and fell at his feet and worshipped him. But Peter raised him up, saying, stand up. I too am also just a man. Acts 10, 25 and 26. I, you know, I don't take into account what a person is, whether they are given vain glory in the world. I, I have admitted, when we lived in Belize, I just tell you this, and we're going to have to close on this. I was given an opportunity to share the gospel with and fellowship with people that went to the garbage piles to get something to eat. And I also had the opportunity to share the gospel with the, the Attorney General of the country and the Prime Minister of the country. 
I mean, one end of the spectrum to the other end of the spectrum, but you want to know something? There's no difference between them. No. They're just men. We're all just men. And you want to know something? We're all sinners. Some saved by the grace of God. And if you can recognize the fact, if you can remember what you are, what you were, that you are a sinner saved by the grace of God. That's that's why I'm, I don't take offense at things because we're not allowed to. But I'm concerned about this whole movement of Black Lives Matter. Well, black lives do matter because every life matters. And one life is not more valuable than another. Because every single life on the planet of this uh, this planet Earth, Jesus Christ died because God the Father sent him to die in their place, so that they might have the availability of eternal life and salvation. God's no respecter of persons; He loves the lowest as what is the, the highest. But how, who's high? He is high and lifted up. Only you. Peter would not take God's glory because Peter knew that it was written in Isaiah 42, I am Yahweh. I am that I am. That is my name. I will not give my glory to another, nor my praise to graven images. Isaiah 42. Watch, watch your little statues and your trinkets and baubles. Remember that Jesus teaching us the way we should pray to the Father said, for thine is the glory. Matthew 6, 13. What are the graven images that the Lord refers to in that passage of Isaiah? You answer that question. Do you have any graven images in your life? Or is Jesus Christ the object of your worship? Is God the object and focus of your life? Father, I just thank you, Lord, that you have given us such a great gift. I thank you, Lord, that you have loved us so much that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to do for us what we could never do for ourselves. That he went to that cross for the joy set before him to take upon himself the punishment for our sin. I praise you and thank you for that, Lord. And I pray that we would be faithful in doing your word. I mean, we would have, have heard your word, we would believe your word, and we would do your word, Lord God. And we would take that love that you've poured into our hearts and take it out into that cold, dark world and let our light shine to touch other lives. And thank you, Lord, that you've given us that in Jesus' name. Well, until next week, God bless you and goodbye. Remember, you can write to us at office at BibleTalk.com with any questions or comments. Or say hi. Or just say hi. Write to me. Tell me you love me. God bless you and goodbye until next time.